hi everyone and um, welcome to this uh, platform talk here at Bergen Kunsthal and also to our audiences out online. Um, this is a live streamed event today. Um, my name is Nora Svante Almes and I'm the live program curator here at Bergen Kunsthal. Um, the talk today, Queer Methodologies in Curating an Art, uh, takes place on the occasion of the live project uh, Cruising Utopia. And I'm really happy to be joined today by incredible um, colleagues in the field, um, Tominga O'Donnell, Naeem Davis, and Sarah Sassanelli, who all made um, their way to Bergen today and for the project and tomorrow. Um, and while I'm really happy to have um, so many incredible artists also in the audience and in town and um, yeah, the speakers here, I think it's been a really beautiful kind of get together for the project. And um, yeah, we were in shock this morning about the news that came in from Oslo about the attacks and we still are. It was an attack on our queer community, so our thoughts are with everyone in Oslo today. Um, so it's a hard day for everyone. And um, I think it's important to remember that we're creating a space of support, community, and, and also joy in all of that. And I think it's maybe more urgent than, than ever. So apologies if we're a bit zoned out during the talk today. I think it was uh, not what we expected. Uh, but I'm glad that we are all together. Yeah. So I will briefly introduce our guests. Um, we have here um, Sarah Sassanelli, who is a curator at the uh, ICA in London and an associate of the studio program Conditions in London. They're interested in supporting um, work at the intersections of sound and choreography, and they're currently uh, undertaking research on references to rave culture in contemporary life practices. Then uh, Naeem Davis, who is an interdisciplinary artist and curator with a sentimental approach, we like to call it. Um, their work has emotional resonance, processing feelings of disempowerment, defiance, joy, nostalgia, and desire. As the creative director and co-founder of BAPES, which is um, a collective, um, for the past six years, they have produced events across the globe and worked in partnerships with Tate, the ICA, Dazed, um, Afropunk, and also the British Council. As a collective, um, BAPES prioritizes the experiences of queer women, um, trans folk, and non-binary people of color, providing physical and online platforms for emerging queer talent. Um, as an independent artist and creative producer, they remain committed to building intentional spaces for marginalized communities through queer feminist practice and advancing public dialogue around these topics. And Naeem will be um, organizing um, the club night this evening here at uh, Landmark. And um, then here to my right, Tominga O'Donnell, who's a um, senior curator of contemporary art at the Munk Museum in, in um, Oslo where she, they curated the program Munk Muset on the Move, um, which was a project that was going on from 2016 to 2019, adopting a queer curatorial approach and commissioning new work from a range of artists, uh, including Tore Johansson and Marilyn Dijkman, Trollkamp, Sarah Eliasson, Pedro Gomez Angania, and uh, Kirsten Astrup and Maria Bodov. Um, the program received the uh, Norwegian Art Critics Award, in 2018, and um, their educational background is um, a BA from Modern History and Politics from um, University of Oxford and an MA in Curating Contemporary Art from the RCA, and a PhD. <laughs> um, um, uh, from the Oslo School of Architecture and Design uh, on the exhibition as a spatial construct. Um, they also have, have been an associate professor here at the Art Academy um, where some of you might know them from. Um, so today, um, we will first hear of um, some of the um, really incredible projects that you've been doing and that ha you have done, uh, some interesting research, and um, then we will just kind of dive into a conversation and have some 
uh, yeah, a little bit of questioning and discussion, I guess, and then uh, I will open up for questions from the audience. So I'm going to see if my PowerPoint skills here work out. Let's see. Yeah, and... Uh, Okay, I will just Ooh. click, you just let me know. Oh, okay, you thank have you. The word, um, <laughs> thank you, Noura, and thank you everyone for, for coming today, um, both physically in this space and also online. Um, my aim for today is to get through it without crying because of events uh, last night. Oh, that went well. <laughs> um, it's really important that we're gathered together <coughs> in this space. Two seconds. Um, okay, <clears throat> Munk Museum on the Move was a project that I curated um, for the Munk Museum in Oslo. Um, some of my former students who are here in this space have, have heard this talk maybe before. Um, so I'm going to do a very <laughs> thanks for the tissues. Um, um, I'm going to give a very sort of uh, brief introduction to it because uh, a, a long one takes a long time and I don't want to take time away from these two incredible people who have come, flown far to be here with <laughs> us uh, today. So um, as a curatorial strategy, Munk Museum on the Move started out as a way of lifting up aspects of the neighbourhood that the Munk Museum at Tayen would be... Um, moving through on its way down to Björvika, which is on the waterfront where this new 13-storey building now um, stands. Um, the brief to the artists that we invited w was to find some aspect of the neighbourhood which they considered uh, marginalised, ignored, uh, or somehow overlooked. So this map, which was made by my colleague Vilda, uh, shows the different sort of aspects of the neighbourhood which were invoked um, during these the four years of the project. And I define that approach as queer, but that doesn't mean that, um, A, all of the artists identified as queer who were, who were in the programme, um, nor were, that the projects were necessarily sort of queer in terms of, of content. Um, maybe if you can click to the next one. Uh, but some of them were explicitly, and we started off with a project by uh, um, Swedish artist Sam Hultin, um, which I started off as an as a independent curator. I commissioned them to, to do one of the versions of I Am Every Lesbian uh, in Oslo. I'd seen a project in Malmö previously. And what um, Hultin does so effectively is to, to, to inter go into um, local communities and, in a sense, um, extract in the best possible way stories that might otherwise be forgotten connected to lesbian asterisk history. And then these stories are inscribed onto the cityscape uh, from their original location through a sound um, recording that Sam makes, but also through city walks and then this map which hung on the edifice of the Munk Museum, which obviously is a museum dedicated to Edvard Munk. So it had this sort of quite interesting juxtaposition of a, a monument to a dead white male artist uh, and then lesbian history plastered on its, on its facade. Um, and we had our first city walk under Oslo Pride in 2016. It was a week after the Orlando massacre. So it was also a very deeply emotional moment. And a little bit like today, felt important to come together as a group, uh, a supportive space, and, and reflect um, not only over the immediate loss, but uh, the kinds of uh, losses and struggles that our community has gone through, but ultimately suffused with some kind of um, joy as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is what I feel like with a lot of the queer projects that are done, that there's, a, there's a mix. There's always a sort of, obviously with HIV crisis, there's always sort of... Um, a sense of sadness imbued, um, but at the same time, this, this, this struggle to create spaces of joy. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time, but I'll just click through the next one. Uh, yeah, so this, we had a, Trollkrem is a, was a performance duo based in Oslo, done incredible performance work for a number of years. Um, Tore Erik Bö had this um, pride float for Oslo Pride. 
um, we invited extended members of the community together with, I don't know if you can see it, there's a giant homage to um, John Waters in the form of a popper's bottle on the back of this. In, poignant today is uh, the Oslo Pride Parade should be underway now and was cancelled um, due to police advice in Oslo. Um, Trollkem imported a number of different performances, and this is how it might dovetail with some of, of your programs, which are sort of off-site. Uh, we were talking a little bit about earlier um, about the difference between operating within the institutional frame of the museum uh, and the kinds of um, conversations and vibes that you can create in other spaces. Mm -hmm. So Trollkem created a performance art tour, um, which was, for instance, at a bar which no longer exists called Ivash Kru, where Seth Bogart, Vaginal Davis, and uh, Dynasty Handbag were. Uh, of course, someone in, who were very much sort of mentioned and referenced in uh, Jose Esteban Minos's Cruising Utopia, um, but also intermixed with um, local artists from the Oslo scene, but also, for instance, Ender Sombi, who is a Sami activist and uh, Yoike uh, and academic. So, t in a sense, messying or in, in, the, in the most sort of positive sense, different perspectives, um, but again, all of it suffused with um, joy and a certain amount of mm. silliness. Um, I'm going to go to my final slide, I think, if I manage to press your computer buttons properly. Uh, we closed with a project by Kishin Astrup and Maria Bordorf, who are a duo based in Copenhagen. And they created a film cabaret in, named after a painting by Edvard Munch, Summer Night by the Beach, and inspired by the history of Kongshavn, which was a cabaret stage scene um, in the early 20th century. And then they restaged that in the form of a sort of elaborate cabaret, which also drew in um, various sites in Oslo, like the cruising site in Ekebar uh, forests. Um, and at the center of the, these, uh, they call them cuddly queers, which gather on the mm. beach in the face of uh, its pending climate apocalypse, uh, using this orange light to uh, suggest some kind of sort of pending doom, but also as, a, as an homage to uh, Fassbinder's Kerel. Mm. And you can see the Munch Museum is a papier-mâché um, version right in the back of this uh, Right in the back Wait, of is this. It's this one. Yeah. yeah. I'll just try and uh, the cursor. So it has this kind of kink. Yeah. And I've always said, you know, the origin, that it has in its fundamental architecture queerness. This is the lambda was the original um, symbol for the gay and lesbian front uh, in New York. And uh, when I told um, our director that, he was like, no, it wasn't. And I was like, yes, it was. It totally <laughs> has queerness built into its, its fabric. Um, so that was the final project of, of this ambulating Munch Museum on the Move, and I've worked at the museum for a couple of years subsequently as um, a senior curator of contemporary art and also working closely with commissioning performance and, and trying to take some of this sort of... Um, well, I mean, my strategy will always be queer, but um, to take some of this sort of Eric's experimental approach into yeah. how we program at the museum. Uh, not as easy to do it inside the building as it is to do it off-site, uh, but nonetheless managing to, to continue some of this spirit, I hope. Um, and part of that spirit is uh, one of acknowledgement, of, of trying to acknowledge the other initiatives which have taken place in that area, so to not come in as one sort of solo institution trying to uh, do something in the community, but working with existing smaller scale institutions, but also uh, other kinds of non-art institutions in order to create some kind of um, dialogue mm. once we move into the, to the new building and acknowledging that that came before us. Um, okay, that was my presentation. Um, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so and thank you for bearing with me as well. That's <laughs> very you. appreciated. So I will move on to um, Sarah's project. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I'm Sara. I work at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Um, and I predominantly work uh, with live practice. So I'm specifically interested in live dance practices that don't easily fit into dominant platforms for dance. And I'm talking specifically from a London context because I know uh, the dance scene is very different everywhere you go. So um, yeah, for me, it's specific to that. Uh, and I wanted to share 
kind of the very, very beginning of a piece of research that I think will inform my program going forward and will touch on some of the commissions that I've done for ICA previously. So the research is titled Rave Residues, uh, and it broadly looks at references to rave culture and club culture in contemporary live practice, but with a focus on dance. So um, it came out of me thinking about the increased presence of rave culture in art institutions and in contemporary performance. I've worked with, across clubs, raves, and art institutions in the last few years. Um, and I sort of wanted to seek beyond, um, or I guess seek to move beyond the narrative that rave culture is rendered dead within the cultural institution, which no doubt this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But I was kind of interested in this third space that can be created between the gallery, the rave, and performance, mm -hmm. and what might come out of that if I looked at it a bit more forensically. So um, I'm keen to identify and think about rave as a material, and more specifically in terms of uh, what its residues might be. And the term residues is uh, very much informed by Madison Moore's text, Dark Room, Sleaze in the Queer Archive, um, and the way that they use it to talk about uh, the club space and kind of like the actual residues of like the floor after a party. Um, but also I'm really interested in thinking about it um, in terms of performance and how the residues of liveness Operate. So the impressions, the feelings, the connections left in the room after a work ends, but also muscle memory and how um, dancing has an impact on the body and how dance, watching dance also has an impact on the body. Um, and yeah, for me, at its, at its most hopeful, live performance is a vehicle that might change the relationship to the self uh, while also being an experiment of, of being together. Um, and for me, the research responds to living in particular, particularly fragmented times where collectivity seems less possible, uh, while maybe we also have more estranged relationships with the self, and I'm trying to look at what performance can do for that and how it fits in. Um, and how I relate it to rave as well is, um, I think of the dance floor in its many versions and many iterations uh, as, a, as a collaborative space that doesn't actually seek uh, consensus, but can be kind of a porous space, uh, rich with the ability to speculatively think about desire. Um, and again, um, referencing Madison Moore again, I'm really interested in working with these unruly or disorderly or uncategorized traces from dances that don't generally fit into the respectability politics of dominant dance cultures or practices. Um, and this is really informed by exchanges I have with an artist uh, in London, Charlie Ashwell. Um, and we talk a lot about the underworld of technique, so I'm interested in uh, the possibility of using the underworld of technique or artists who are rethinking technique, remaking, reinventing their forms. And um, to directly quote Charlie, uh, they've said to me, there are always bodies that don't fit, always the possibility of remaking technique, repurposing technique, always the possibility of subverting, even desecrating the theatrical space. Um, so, I thought I would start with an example of one of uh, the first commissions I did for ICA. Um, and I'll speak about Dykegeist by Eve Stainton, who Nora will also be bringing. So you'll, if you're here, you'll have a chance yeah. to see it in November. Yes, November. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so Eve references um, Manchester Speed Garage, um, and in the work sort of conjures these images of a haunted club space. So I'll just quickly show you the video. It's about 50 seconds.
So um, that's just a very short amount of documentation from the ICA show, and the score is by Mika Levy, who was Eve's collaborator. Um, and um, part of the choreographic material with Eve's work is um, the relationship between Eve and the audience. As you can see, there's elements of interaction which takes up most of the second half of the work, and there are these kind of intimate exchanges. Um, and throughout the first half of the work, Eve appears disconnected and untethered from the group, dressed in sort of this armor uh, consisting of these uh, raver sunglasses. Uh, and they engage in moments of negotiation in a really simple gesture. They sort of crouch down to the person that they wish to talk to and just lift um, their sunglasses to make eye contact. Uh, and they use whispering and clear directed instructions to involve the audience and there's always the chance to decline. Um, and then they engage in these intimate movement sequences that range from crawling across the space together, pulling objects out of gravel, um, uh, sort of asking audience members to gel their hair in spikes, uh, or the, the kind of moving down to the floor together that you saw in the, in the video. Um, and the work moves through these different atmospheres kind of held by the score um, and, and creates these social situations to discuss threat, consent, otherness. Um, and for me, this is really a way into mapping the rich complexity of the overlapping histories of electronic music, its intersection with queer culture, and now its, uh, its sort of increasing presence in, in live practice, even though, of course, <coughs> it's, it's always been there. Uh, the second example I wanted to give was examining more what happens when references to rave are less visible but still felt. So I wanted to speak about Fernanda Munoz Newsom's practice, whose work has both literally referenced rave but also has used its relational experiences as a material. So um, in her work, she often ex abstracts those relational elements and uses them to guide and encourage a different way of relating to one another as viewers. And she does this through voice and, and direction and gesture. Um, and she's very much talking to the audience as a group. It's uh, less sort of on an uh, interpersonal level. Um, and she's also often in inverting the gaze by being directly in dialogue with her audience as a big group, being amongst them, moving in proximity, and, and making everyone's presence felt to one another. Um, so I think she really attempts to dissolve this sort of individual practice of witnessing. It's much more about, oh, a collective version of, of witnessing. Um, and so that separation between performer and audience, but also between audience and audience, is, is really vulnerable in, in her works. Um, and I think this is another example of technique that evolves outside of the dominant logics of spectacle. Um, and yeah, uh, this is a work uh, that she reconfigured uh, for ICA. It's called Let the Body. Um, and for this work, she was using the memory of collective dance in rave spaces. So this was like more of a direct reference, I would say. And uh, she was using this hypnotic sound by Shelley Parker, which is actually made of uh, m sounds of the movements uh, that are generated through dancing. Um, and I think in this work, there's a kind of deep listening as a form of grounding, but also really, again, she's encouraging this very sharpened collective perception. Um, yeah, so I think uh, for me, some of the questions that she's asking with it are, is it possible to kind of rave from inside the body? And, and is this raving connected to raging and kind of uniting these energies into more of a kind of resting liveness and remembering the heat and the proximity and the relentlessness of uh, the experience that you might have in a club or, or in a rave. How many times can I say the word rave? Let's, <laughs> let's see. Um, yeah, so I really think of these practices as summonings of dances that are ordinarily found in these spaces, and they're kind of messy encounters between trained skill, 
uh, and maybe throwaway movement, if there is such a thing, uh, and the intimate knowledge found in this act of raving. And for me, this kind of work is, is a continuation of what raving has done for a long time as this expansive project that has reinvented and complicated, um, even adapted or reconfigured identity, and also the relationship between identity and, and the collective. Uh, and I'm interested in how uh, these artists are attuning, uh, attuning these materials to performance making. And for me, this attuning process signals this kind of, um, the force of the choreographic as, as a vehicle to challenge and disrupt internalized concepts or, or desires. Uh, and sort of the last thing I wanted to mention as well was that I think the club space or the rave space or the gig space also offers a different level of informality. And it's, some, it's a place where temporally you can kind of do what you want. You can move, in, move through the space in different ways, much more than in a kind of sit down theater where you're sort of confined to your chair. Um, and I think it's no surprise that also these uh, works very much allow for a, a kind of movement in and out and a kind of engaging or a not watching or a missing something. So uh, I think it allows to process the work in a, in a slightly different way. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I'm just really interested in its potential as a kind of more philosophical project, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Okay, I will test my technical skills here now. Um, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my name is Naeem Davis. Uh, I'm a curator, cultural producer. I'm doing it for a minute now, but with no formal like arts education, just love to club. I grew up in a uh, strict, um, conservative, Pentecostal, Seventh-day Adventist church. And as much as the religion clashed with my identity, I loved praise and worship. And if you haven't been to a church before, praise and worship, or a black church for that matter, a Caribbean church, praise and worship is a part of the day where for as long as it takes, everybody, somebody, a praise and worship leader comes up and leads everybody into song and dance and just reverence in general. And people who have been stushed that entire day, rank faced, rude, will let everything come forward, bring all of themselves to that moment, whether it be hand in the air, crying, shaking, dancing, singing. It was a moment that I was completely enamored with, and so it became, it was no surprise to me that the club became my place of worship later on in life. Um, that being said, when I came into my queerness and was going to uh, white, cis, gay, homonormative spaces, I was experiencing the same violence as I was experiencing in church there, but it was different, you know, it was more around my race, my class, my gender, and so I was like, right, I've been spending money working in these spaces for years. Let me do my own night. Let me create my own space where I could bring all of myself, which is when I invented or came up with uh, BBZ, which was a club night specifically for queer and trans people of the global majority and black and brown women. Um, while it was a club space and it was important for us, just a space that pe pe people could bring all of their intersections and we could have a conversation about what that meant, we also introduced performance art, visual art, um, that would start the evening um, off and then slowly descend into debauchery. And sometimes we'd keep the works up, sometimes they'd come down, but um, it meant that it had this kind of two-pronged element with the visual arts and the clubbing. Um, Institutions caught onto it very quickly and was like, let's bring these people in, let's uh, in some ways be extractive, but it did help our practice as curators. And I think after a while we became burnt out working with institutions that were mentioned. Um, and we decided to go completely DIY and separate the clubbing from the visual arts. Uh, so we do about two shows a year. Um, that were basically looking at highlighting uh, queer and trans artists, again, of black ancestry, African ancestry. They did extremely well, launched some careers of some really amazing artists that we have today. Um, but again, collectives, under-resourced, um, interpersonal drama. We, we didn't go as far as we'd like to in the pandemic hit. Uh, but as a 
solo practitioner. Um, I've gone on to create uh, numerous festivals and exhibitions, again, with the same, I guess, sentiment of trying to bring all of myself and the artist selves to the exhibition or to the space. Um, one of these festivals, uh, you might have heard of it, it's uh, called Lesbianale. Um, we actually premiered at the ICA London. And I find talking about it or synthesizing it kind of difficult, so I'm just going to read the curator statement and you can get a gist. One sec. Hold tight for a sharp selection of global art, music, performance, and film centering sidelined identities and communities within lesbianism, because we know that dykes are not a monolith, but in fact, a gorgeous, nuanced mess. This is for trans lesbians, non-binary POC lesbians, dark-skinned lesbians, lesbians who like sex, lesbians who like getting paid for sex, lonely lesbians, long-haired lesbians, queer lesbians, ex-lesbians, big dick lesbians who like three sugars in their tea, Black nerdy lesbians, your lesbian neighbor who hates you, and all the other marginalized bocats of the lesbian world. To say lesbian is not to say binary or woman or pussy. It sought the OG lesbian icon Sappho, the ancient Greek poet who lived on the island of Lesbos, where the word lesbian originates, was herself known to enjoy lovers of all genders. While it's impossible to know if this is actually true or not, Maybe it's worth repeating anyway, as a salve for those of us who have felt not lesbian enough and because it doesn't actually matter, does it? Sometimes it feels nice to be a lesbian, to have a home for a while, to honor the feeling that perhaps inherent in that word is something that explains the way you're moving in that moment better than any other word currently available. Pansexual doesn't always slap in the way you need it to. <laughs> The word lesbian is a label, and like all label, it provides a type of freedom via its provision of language to a particular subculture or experience that would otherwise gladly be overlooked by the masses. Like all labels, it is also on some level constricting and exclusive, fundamentally disappointing, and once dominated by dusty white cis transphobic energy inhabitable to, men to many. Who thought it would be a good idea to affix the colonizer's language to matters of body and soul and spirit and sex anyway? Man could never. While it's true that lesbians are angry all the time, it's, it's okay because we're also fucking all the time. We're changing, trolling, loving at all times. We're playing it by ear, sweetie. We're bleeding at the altar of thank God I'm gay and lesbian culture is lying in bed with her and seeing who dies first. A lot of fast and gentle and sad. A lot of put it in my mouth now and we can work out what to call it later. Okay, daddy? Lesbianale 2019 allows us to explore our intersections and complications and fantasies and fears by showcasing art that represents some parts of the huge and magmatic expression contained within the word lesbian. Dig with us through the lesbian archives they failed to destroy and dream with us of the sweetest sap the coldest metal, the gayest future. Text by Aisha Mercer. I read that out because it kind of sums up the kind of playful, colloquial, just trying to, trying to get more accessible. I know how academic the art space can be, the art institutions can be. And as somebody who is working class, trans, and black living in the UK, I want to invite my peers who are questioning many aspects of themselves and trying to bring more of themselves to spaces to engage with art spaces. Um, and as someone who's neurodivergent also, just trying to constantly ask myself what part of myself I'm not bringing and just to remind everyone like art's about play. So that is kind of like the, at the crux of my curation and who I pick to work with, how I work. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it flops. Uh, it takes a lot of work as well. People don't always believe in it because they're not seeing the structures that they're used to. But Keep trying. <laughs> but yeah, that's that with me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I wrote down a couple of things that I feel that um, kind of um, maybe are um, aspects that all your practices kind of um, 
um, entail, which is, so for example, the collective or collaborative um, approach was mentioned, moving into different spaces, but also um, the informality that comes with that and kind of breaking away from you know, the, the structures that we find ourselves in, I guess, socially, but also um, institutionally. And um, I wanted to uh, start out with the question of um, yeah, the queer approach, because also, Tominga, you mentioned that um, queerness in curating an art doesn't necessarily have to do with sexuality, and I think that's really something that's important to um, point out, that, um, yeah, it can be removed from that. And um, I was wondering if you um, all can maybe say a couple of things about what this queer approach that we're maybe all still exploring as a kind of, you know, constant learning, I feel like that, what that means to you in, in all, you know, in your practices, but also working in different contexts. Um, does yeah. anyone like to start? Do you want, Do you to, want start? to start? <laughs> sure, go for it. <laughs> we can break this rhythm as well. It's not very quiet. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> we well, can just That's jump in. Um, in. No, I mean, I think... Uh, what has become quite clear in my own sort of queer approach is that I'm aiming for some sort of sense of um, an expansive approach, um, mm -hmm. which we touched upon. In, in, so it's not about kind of necessarily a queer identity, but that's also a way of trying to um, encompass or providing space for people who don't necessarily define themselves as queer but still mm. want to live or work outside of heteronormativity or heteropatriarchy. Mm. Um, and I'm having a lot of conversations about this um, recently, like <laughs> people struggling to define themselves. Are they queer adjacent? Uh, you know, are they allies? Yeah. Um, and I think it, what's sort of fundamentally queer about such an approach is that it's inevitably slippery. It, it doesn't define an inside and an outside. Mm. Um, because once you start doing that form of demarcation, then you're into that sort of territory of the, the sort of negative connotations of lesbian, you know, mm. the, 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 the transphobic, the very sort of cis white. Mm. Um, so I think that, that sort of sense of, a, of expansion is really important and slipperiness and, and ev mm. evading sort of definition mm. uh, or certain sort of classification. But also... Um, that it's a form of celebration and also a form of um, acknowledgement of, that's what I was talking a little bit mm. about earlier, acknowledging the, all the work that has been done either before or being done in parallel to, to what one might be doing as mm. a representative of a large institution. Um, and that uh, sort of seeps through for most things that I do. Uh, and then there's a, a form of um, openness to collaboration, like in the sense that, that maybe you and I have had. Mm. Um, we work in different cities. There's no reason why we can't sort of share resources, try to co-program. So this complete sort of rejection of a, a form of competition, mm. which I think is associated with um, a form of a capitalist, patriarchal, heteronormative mm. way of, you know, you have to have been the first. Uh, mm. And if you're not the first, you're the biggest. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that whole logic to try and sort of uh, get away from that, um, I think, is, is some of the things. And then, yeah, to try and have some kind of pockets of joy. Yeah. And allyship, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mentioned yeah. earlier, not to take up too much time, but... The, as an artist, Marnie Slater, uh, who talked about specific tools that one might want to use, and that uh, she talked about using a map of allies. Um, one partly is the people that you, you turn to who are your sort of personal allies, but also where they are in institutions so that mm. you can... Because it can be harrowing sometimes looking at the, the art landscape mm. and then thinking, oh, it's... It's all, you know, the worst aspects of the Venice Biennale preview days. Um, and, and it isn't necessarily. There are some really thoughtful, warm, queer, queer-adjacent people working in institutions and remind yourself that these people exist. And I think something as literal uh, as a map of where they are <laughs> just can be really kind of reassuring and heartening. Yeah, yeah I can definitely empathize with that. I, when we first started working on BBZ, I remember we were quite militant. Like, we would uh, 
police the door in a way that and we ended up turning away people who we just assumed their gender, assumed their mm. sexuality. Well, I didn't, but the people on the team did. And um, we kind of had to just question ourselves because we would, we would get people um, DMing us saying that this person was there and they're not trans or they're not queer or they're not this or that. And just assuming people's identities, but also their experiences and why they're, what they're, intentions were at the night, so we had to change the language around it to, um, you know, just, we want people, rather than turn anyone away, we just want you to consider how you're contributing to this space and why you, why you come. Um, but yeah, language has moved on so much and like ideas around queerness have shifted so much. And I used to be someone who ex exclusively worked with like queer people of the global majority. And I realized I need allies, I need accomplices to get anything done and yeah, my, my approach to language, even like when we um, came up with the name Lesbianale, we had to work so hard to think about how we squeezed mm. ourselves into the term and created room within it. Um, mm. But yeah, it's always evolving, and I think that's a big part of my practice as well, is going at any given moment, like what have I learned, and then what, how do I feed that into the work and the curation? Mm. Yeah, I think about evolving as well, and also a kind of healthy or yeah I try to practice some kind of healthy dose of ambivalence to whenever I feel like too fixed on mm. something mm. Um, uh, which is interesting also in relation to like what that means then if you're thinking about creating tools um, but I think both things can kind of coexist um, and I guess like I think a lot about hosting in my position at ICA and what it what it means to work collaboratively with artists and I am drawn to kind of more informal uh, relationships of exchange um, and I think that also sits well within performance because often that it, that can be an incredibly collaborative practice when you're producing somebody's show um, so I think that for me it's it's really connected to like also working from a place of either friendship or a place where friendship can emerge, uh, which I think can be really quashed by the sort of over professionalization or like the kind of careerist attitude mm. that the art world fosters. So I think I try and kind of wedge myself in between those things. Yeah, and I guess that also goes back then to. Um yeah, allyship and how to how to find each other, I guess, and how to connect. And I think that um, yeah, just a map would be definitely first <laughs> like very helpful in that. But um, I wanted to um, go back to this word um, infiltrator that Naim uh, uses quite a lot because Naim um, works as an independent curator and kind of very differently to all three of us. Um, and kind of enter spaces that are maybe not, uh, yeah, not not ready to accommodate appropriately, and you know, it's a lot of navigating. But I wanted to go back to this word, inf infiltrator. word uh, infiltrator, which I quite liked. Um, um, yeah. yeah, I think I came up with the term. Well, obviously, not the word infiltrator, but like <laughs> <laughs> in reference to. Um, uh, the art industry in that like every time uh, I had an experience with an institution it was mostly because somebody there on staff who had just realized something about themselves or wanted something to change something about the institution had brought us in and they did so much work to protect us um, they they were like just a, the solid conduit to our work and then the access and resource that the institution had for us to amplify our work. And I would always tell my peers, like, remember so-and-so because they're doing that work. They, they have to deal with that every day. And often they were black and brown um, people, often women or trans folk in these institutions where they weren't necessarily accommodated for themselves. So I would always say to my peers, like, yeah, like, so let's celebrate this person, check in on them. If, you're, if you have access to something, bring them in also, because these, these infiltrators are, are saving grace in terms of like being sustainable as independent curators and artists. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And um, the other aspect I kind of wanted to take out a bit is, um, so, for example, you two work with club, club spaces quite quite a lot, and um, to, it's also quite an um, 
yeah, it's an ephemeral space to be in and also working with life practices, something that we, we, we all do, I guess. It's always this, um, yeah, there are these short moments of, um, you know, getting everything right in that moment and, or not right in a performance sense, but a lot can happen maybe. It's like, it's, there's also this idea of unpractability, not like it's quite fluid we don't know what you know audiences there are so many aspects to that but also i think this um non-staticness of that idea of a, you know of club culture or rave culture um in the dark let's say you know these kind of things um i always think there are so many aspects to yeah to learn from from institutions that feel quite static and i was wondering um if you want to elaborate a little bit on, on your work and your, like, taking the club as an inspirational space, maybe. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it goes a little bit back to what I said um, about how, it, to my mind, the club is kind of an inherently collaborative space, like on its kind of basic level, it's like everybody makes the party, like everybody makes it happen. Mm. Um, it like can't happen with just the DJs in the room. It can't happen with just the people in the room. Like there's a kind of alchemy to it that I think is, is its, its strength. And, uh, and it's sort of, that's sort of what conceptually inspires me to think about the club as this kind of fugitive site that can't really be pinned down and that can sort of escape a lot of things that are trying to kind of trap it down. Mm. Um, and, and I guess for me that's, uh, that's somehow how I'd like my curatorial practice to feel. Whether mm -hmm. I succeed in that or not, maybe I'll reflect in like 20 years and figure it out. <laughs> but, um, but for yeah. now, it's kind of what, what draws me to it. And um, I think also because for a while, the, the club was kind of being... Um, I guess co-opted by a lot of different institutions. Maybe you have many thoughts about this. <laughs> um, and uh, and I really understood the critique of like, oh, it's it's just kind of being rendered dead by this space and like the architecture or like the all the myriads of things that can go wrong when a club uh, is is being hosted by an institution. Um, but when I had this opportunity at ICA, we can get a very late license till six, well, for London, 6 a.m. is a very late license. Not, not, oh, for here too, maybe <laughs> yeah. not for Berlin, but that's okay. And um, yeah, so uh, having this late license and the potential to work with uh, Inferno, who are a, a queer techno collective based in London, um, who I have like a, a very good relationship with and a lot of like mutual solid trust, then I started to see like the possibilities of what could actually happen if you sort of had this third space, which is for me is like, what is the gallery giving you that the club isn't? And what is the club giving you that the gallery isn't? Mm. And I was, I was getting really interested in exploring that. And uh, yeah, we used the, the cinemas and we used the theater for performance, but then we also had music running until six. Um, and it, and it was just really wild. And I think like the kind of wildness of it was, uh, was really exciting for me in that space. Um, yeah, so mm. I think that's how I kind of, th this third space that it creates, I'm still trying to grapple with and mm. understand what it, what it can offer. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask something um, potentially mm. controversial? Because sure. I'm sitting here thinking, and, I, and I've been in this space before, uh, celebrating club culture and talking about it. It's such a wonderful space. But it is uh, almost invariably ableist and ageist, mm. um, among other things. So when you were talking there about how the gallery can provide something that the club can't and, uh, and vice versa, I was wondering if that was something that you sort of thought about in relation to... Yeah. Sorry to throw this at you, no, no. completely I, out the blue. I think <laughs> it's a, it's a fair, really fair question. Yeah, I think it, Inferno, the reason I also like to work with Inferno is because they think about those, those elements as a kind of a core part of their practice. 
I don't find the ICA building a very accessible building, and I think most of my colleagues would uh, would agree. It's a really old building. It has um, like it's very un unlevel. Mm. Um, it's the where we did do the club is totally level mm. access, but I still don't. I mean, also access means many many different things, um, and I think also in terms of. Ageism, I find that really interesting because um, the clubs that I've recently experienced feel quite intergenerational, but they're, maybe they're like specifically contexts that I'm around in London. Um, but I, I would say that gener generally the club, like, I mean, the club is also complicated, I think, because what is mm. the club? It's like there's not really a monolithic. Mm. Uh, club, so I guess I'm. I'm. The way that I would enter that question is like there. You always have like an agency as an organizer to like stretch it or make it or reach the right people, and or the people that you think you would like to reach. And I think it was interesting what you said earlier about you saying that you were observing who was not in the room and how that would like inform um, how you would move on in your practice. And I think that's really resonant and that's like all you can really do in those moments when you realize that uh, there's, that you've like missed something out. Mm. And I think it's something potentially that institutions don't do enough of. It's like that reflection mm. moment of who haven't we reached, who isn't here, uh, and, and also more importantly, why? Because I think also institutions maybe are doing the work of who isn't here, but they're not doing so much the, the why. Okay. And that's something that I'm also kind of increasingly mm. learning, especially working with performance that often also includes touch or participation, mm. which is not something everybody is up for, mm. and nor, nor does it have to be. Yeah. Sorry to hijack your, uh, oh, no, <laughs> your no, question. No, and I, uh, you know, you're free, please feel free to ask each other questions. I think that's quite interesting, actually. Thank you. But Naeem, did you want to uh, share some thoughts on the working in these club spaces and then maybe bringing these experiences um, back to the, you know, the, the art projects or potentially uh, institutional spaces? I thought your question was really interesting in that, the, about the, it being like essentially a bit ableist and accessible and not intergenerational enough. And one of the first things we ever did when we were putting together what Babes was, was to draw on the club but also draw on like our origins and understandings of the party and the party space and for us it was a lot of hall parties african parties or west african parties nigerian hall parties that were centered on everyone being able to be there from mm. children to older adults to people with like mobility issues and so we always think about those components of like what made that safe what made that accessible we always have food at anything we do, and, and it's usually Caribbean or like something from one of one of our cultures. Um, we have many recovery zones, um, and we've started introducing like recovery zones for neurodivergent people. So like, if there's like games, books, um, fidget widgets, um, uh, we're always thinking about the cost of everything and try and get to people to subsidize it. We have like. Uh, trans taxi funds uh, that people contribute to throughout the night, especially. And then we have like pay it forward tickets and stuff like that. Um, and whenever we're doing anything with the institution, we have to take that to them and being like, how are you going to implement these things? These are fundamental parts of our practice. How do you make it work? Um, and we make them use different ticketing sources. We make them go through like specific training, good night out trainings, a good one in London, as well as um, gendered intelligence. Um, it's, but it's laborious, and often the budgets don't cover it. Mm. But yeah, um, it's always possible, but um, it comes with a lot of work. And now we're at a space where we can ask for the kinds of budgets, and we can, we can take a little bit longer. Like every opportunity we used to get, it was like, we need to get in there now and make sure mm. it happens. Now we're like, okay, well, let's give it 12 months before we put this on and really yeah, make it what it needs to be in order for us to have everybody there and mm. understand the why as to why they're not there. Mm. One other thing that came up, I guess, in, in all of your presentations as well, is this um, idea of the um, collective and the indi individual and, you know, working together, I think. And I think that's um, 
maybe something where you, yeah. So for me, it's always like you also have to see who's who's around you, who's your team, who can you reach out to. At the same time, also who's the audience, and you know there are so many um, aspects I think in uh, maybe working in the ways that we do, where um, you go beyond just thinking about the artistic work, right? Um, do you have um, some examples of, of that, maybe? Or? Me. You can start, <laughs> Naeem, take it away. If, I, if I'm honest, I was just disassociating, so someone picked pick yeah, it go, up go. and then I'll listen. No, I was about to say, could you ask the question again? Maybe we <laughs> ah, just yeah, all sorry. had a collective... <laughs> yeah, 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 no, for sure. No, I was thinking, it came, kind of came from the... Um, yeah, the, the collective working collaboratively and these kind of things and um, yeah, kind of wondering how that yeah, and the consideration of audience, your t the team maybe, who do you work with, who do you invite with, uh, to invite to your projects, and kind of creating this, I don't know, network, these kind of things. If um, you had an example of maybe, um, yeah, quite concrete, because I like these, you know, practical um, Approaches. It's not like a direct question, but I was mm. just thinking if there are examples that um, come to mind working collectively and considering all these different different aspects. There's some um, there's some very sort of baseline things that I uh, I'll do at ICA, for example. So. Um, we wouldn't turn anybody away for lack of funds. So there's, uh, an, we just have a policy that you just you can email and ask for a free ticket. Um, and that's not like a kind of limited uh, capacity. It's more about how you get that message out yeah. and make sure that people know about it. Mm -hmm. um, in other, more speaking to the collective um, idea of like collaboration. So there's a specific project that I'm thinking of, which is with an artist, um, Yen Chun Lin, who started this collaborative research platform. And she, is bringing the work to ICA, but she's actually invited me to contribute to the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess kind of uh, trying to unwind this relationship of like the curator and the artist. And because it's also many, there's many people involved, there's over 10 contributors. Um, I also then went on residency with Yen and we started like thinking about the, the work together. So that's also like a different way that um, I guess like I've not really been afforded to work in that way in previous mm. uh, institutional jobs. Like that's been more for like stuff that I've been doing on the side or, you know, things mm. that I'm organizing myself. Um, so that's, that's been an interesting, con like kind of, it's been interesting to introduce that into um, like on the side of my other projects where like I don't always get the chance to work in that way. And, mm. and actually, it's just kind of a privilege to be able to work in that way. Mm. Mm. I've recently been weaving like radical care into the collaborative space with artists. I'm working on this project at the moment with um, several artists in Cape Town around a photographic project about how queerness and transness is, in, is inherently African. And one of the things I, I, I got out of the institution I'm working with was access costs just around like mm. mental health. And mm. not only just that, but like mental health practitioners and spiritual practitioners from their communities. Um, and that's become a big part of how I work collaboratively with artists now is that like everything outside of the work is also covered. Um, so childcare, translators, um, yeah, just making sure that the work itself has a cushion mm. um, because often the work we're doing does bring up stuff and like working in the institutions yeah. and the spaces that we're working in brings up a lot. And I think we're just used to just, you know, transmuting this energy, making this work and walking away, knowing all, all well that we're all gonna crash and mm. you know, burn out afterwards. And so I've yeah, just been trying to, yeah, create more or think more around access for mm. the artists. Yeah. Mm. 
I think I have a um, couple of examples. Uh, one professional and one unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Great, love this. Um, one is to do with uh, trying to refract or disperse curatorial authority. So mm. they instituted a triennial of contemporary art at the Munch Museum, which opens on the 30th of September. Big party, you're all welcome. <laughs> um, and for that, there's a huge curatorial team, including uh, trainee funding that we got from the Arts Council of Norway, um, one of their so-called diversity trainees. Um, and it was important that, that that person wasn't treated like a trainee, uh, but was a full member of the curatorial team. And that also includes like the more junior members of the team or people who have come in at a later stage. And, and I call that professional because it's to do with the currency of how careers are made, right? It's important for them to have that curatorial credit mm. on their CV. And I'm very happy to give it. It doesn't cost me anything to share that. Um, and then provide, try to provide that sort of mental, mentorship and support mm. along the way so that they don't feel lost um, and get, are given too much responsibility too soon. Um, so I think that's been the one really important thing just within the sort of institution. And the other one that we've started with quite recently, um, I'm probably sorry to say, is to... There's a sense of like to be a professional within the workplace. You leave everything to do with the private sphere outside, right? You, you mm. turn up to work and, you're, and you've got your game face on. Um, and to try and uh, to get rid of that in a little bit. And, to, and this is mm. stuff that people, I'm sure you've been using it for years, but you know, checking in with people, how they are um, in other parts of their life mm. so that they feel comfortable when they come to work. I mean, I'm having a bit of a shit day today because you know, I didn't sleep well because of this or my mother's ill or, or th mm. those things are allowed to, to permeate into the working environment because it means that you get a completely different relationship with the person that you're working with. Um, and it's super simple as a tool and mm. it's so sort of effective and you feel like you just, you know people in a different way, you can be supportive to them in a completely different way as opposed to game face, go and cry in the toilets. Mm. Um, so yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Maybe we um, open up to questions. Do we? Do we have any? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First row. <laughs> I, I've been bullied into giving a question. <laughs> I haven't. I do actually do have a question, um, and it might be as coming from a slight institutional position, I guess. But I'm interested in archiving. It's an obsession of mine, and I just wonder how. How, if at all, uh, does an archive come out of the productions that you make? Uh, and I'm assuming that it might also not be interesting to archive, so I'm kind of keeping that open. But maybe, um, yeah, whoever wants mm. to to Can share some question? archival ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, it's an interesting question. Um, I think. In terms of ICA, where I am now, like thinking about it specifically from... Actually, I'll start from the other side. So in terms of um, things that I've done in clubs, I've sort of quite purposefully not uh, documented anything that we've done. I run... Um, I used to run this night called Interview with, a Fr with Friends, and we're now bringing it back. And um, something we spoke about a lot was like, that documentation could kind of be dispersed if people wanted if people wanted to document it it would kind of be their choice to do so and however mm. they wanted to do that in in that space it wasn't something we like overly labored in in any way uh, but as a result we obviously have very little um kind of Inf visual information about those nights uh, so those are kind of just in my memory somehow and um I'm also interested in how uh, archives can be formed through like conversations and hearsay and descriptions and uh, I guess people's memories. Um, thinking about our conversation yesterday about memory. <laughs> Sorry, there's somebody in the audience I had a conversation with <laughs> yesterday. Um, yeah, and then in terms of ICA, uh, somehow that feels more, like I'm more drawn to archiving at ICA for two reasons. One, because um, the archive from the 90s onwards is kind of in boxes. We really need like some sort of mm. uh, 
PhD magical project that decides to unbox all those things and have a look through. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of more interested in, uh, I guess, like the history of the ICA as this space that has um, hosted performance specifically in like a lot of different ways and in ways that were often more adjacent to a kind of DIY practice. Um, and so like, how are we uh, continuing that or not continuing that? Um, and I feel like archiving somehow uh, helps in that process of thinking and evaluating. But for me, it's uh, definitely from, from that perspective. Mm. Can I just jump in on that? Because, mm. uh, uh, I mean, the Munch Museum opened in 1963 and was a site for a number of kind of live art movements. There was a Dada festival in 1967, for instance. Um, and I think part of that archiving that was, took place as, um, during that time means that in a sense we have an excuse to mm. continue. Uh, we have a heritage, if you like, or a history, which is very strategically useful even in just arguing within the institution that this needs to continue because you need to honor your history in a sense. Uh, so it, it can be really useful for that. And just to draw up uh, Tarol Krem again, the, the image that you saw was taken by uh, Norwegian photographer Maria Parsenau. So, and um, Tureric was very uh, clear that he wanted performances documented, but he wanted them documented through still photography, um, and he wanted it to be an artist. Uh, so that becomes the documentation becomes an artwork in and of itself, and and that's quite a nice way of of doing it um, because you can, of course, never recapture the the mm -hmm. live moment, mm -hmm. and this is the inevitable discussion mm -hmm. that we always have when it comes to performance. You know, how does it? How do you represent it when it's not happening as as a live thing? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that kind of documentation is super important for a gazillion reasons. Yeah, I think that it's interesting what you just said because it reminded me both of Fernanda and uh, Eve actually the decision on how that those works were going to be archived was to actually make films of them mm. as in like completely separate works mm. that somehow would uh, operate as really separate from from the performance work itself but obviously still still connected um and again, I think both, it was interesting because both the conversations I had with Eve and with Fernanda were also about um, inviting somebody in, like a filmmaker mm -hmm. in. So it wasn't really about documentation. It was actually about another person's interpretation. So this kind of constant transformation that anyways happens in performance when you're collaborating. Like even with a lighting designer, they kind of are going to sort of yeah. choose what the audience sees in a way or like th there's a lens happening in some way and so yeah I think also really interested in thinking about things that seemingly can't be archived but then when they are there's like these inherent decisions that are being made and what can you trace through those decisions that are being made is it, I think is a really interesting process yeah great um <laughs> uh do all of those things, and um, but I also because I think a lot of Black diaspora rely on oral histories. Mm. Um, we have taken to creating like a kind of personal line amongst all of the um, Black and Brown organisers, queer organisers of like parties and art institutions and art spaces, a sort of like phone line where we all send voice notes and. Mm. Um, recount experiences of club nights, art spaces, um, and it's just become like a little vault of ours um, that hasn't yet to be opened, but I know we're going to do something with it eventually, mm. but I thought, yeah, that was just one way that we could also um, hold anonymity for people, because as much as I used to document every aspect of everything, and when it came to releasing it or using it for anything, finding those individuals and then finding out if they're queer, if they're safe, if, you know, it was just... Mm. It's near impossible, so yeah, the oral, oral histories and also the easy access of WhatsApp, like, it's a great mm. um, archival tool. Yeah, mm. yeah I guess it's, uh, again, about kind of um, finding alternatives to how archiving has been done and how it can serve the purposes that we, we need them to, to, mm. yeah, to fulfill. Are there any, any more questions in the audience? Don't be shy. Okay. 
I'm almost going into like uh, teacher mode where I'm like looking at my former students, be like, you should be in getting involved here. But I've finished <laughs> on, at KMB, so I should no. leave you alone <laughs> on your Saturday. And you've left as well, so you should be left alone. But I will corner you later. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you ask me a question? Okay, last. Yeah, Get yeah. In the, Kato in the back here. That worked. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guilt people into doing it. Like, I'm looking at my students. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, when you've been approached to um, do club nights and invited by institutions, has there been a form of resistance uh, to not do that? Uh, What, from our community? Uh, from you as an organizer, I would. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, loads. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Said no to loads of institutions. Um, the only time it's ever made sense is if it was in line with maybe a work that was showing at the time, or we knew the artist, or we knew the infiltrator who was asking us, and we knew that we'd be protected and that they would abide by our practices. Um, but we've also had call outs from our community when we've announced doing something or call-ins from our community <laughs> about doing something. And we've had to listen because that's our audience, that's our community. But yeah, there's definitely been resistance with the, with the yeah, there's loads of reasons to say no to a lot of people. Um, and also just at the end of the day, the party is um, celebrating a group of people. And if they don't feel like they have access to that space or it would be an anomaly or oxymoronic to have them in this space, then we just won't. Uh, what about you? Mm, I I don't think I've ever like because I also work in institutions. Like I've never thought to actually bring what I do. I keep those things quite separate. So like mm. what I do outside of it sort of tends to stay outside of it. So I've not really been in a position where uh, an institution has asked me to bring something that I was doing. Mm. externally at in, inside. Mm. Mm. And don't ever say no to anything. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, um, but that's also because I've been a little bit, like you were describing, institutionalized um, mm. for so long. But I think, that, uh, I mean, as I said initially, the Sam Hultin I Am Every Lesbian project was initially something as done as a freelancer. Mm. And I had a lot of conversations mm. with them about how do you now feel from working with an independent curator who got some money from the Arts Council, uh, was looking for venues to bring it to, suddenly being an institutional curator, and then also in this space. And mm. that was exactly at the time that the Munch Museum have done their sort of Plus Munch series, where they paired the work of Edvard Munch with six white male artists. Um, so it came at a really uh, interesting point in that museum's history. But I think some, and that was to do with the amount of time I think we spent together and the trust that we built up that, so that I could function as an inf infiltrator or conduit for, for their project um, and take all of those battles that the artist doesn't need to see um, and to kind of, whether it's to do with... Uh, fee for doing it, where the work should be, what kind of kind of technical support should be given for something that's going to stand throughout the whole of the summer, um, to, to do all of those kind of, yeah, to take on the, all of those battles on their behalf. Uh, and that was the conversation, yeah, that we had. Because I wasn't necessarily uh, sure that somebody would want to do that. I mean, it's, it's a mm. sort of con difficult space to take a project which is that sort of sensitive mm. and community-oriented and then just sort of slap it on the wall of a museum which had, at that point, very mm. little history of working uh, with queer communities. Mm. Um, but it was also necessary on the path of, of making and queering that institution, mm. even to the point of just making the word lesbian roll off the tongue of the director in a <laughs> slightly more <laughs> natural way than it was originally. <laughs> hmm. Any any more of um, Tominga students? No. <laughs> <laughs> Former students. Former students, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, so far, I was just wondering if there's any project you're currently working on or it's boiling in your head somewhere that you're particularly excited about. Mm -hmm. 
so many. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think this the the research that I presented is like the very very beginning and will need like a lot more um, time. So I think excited to do something long form because I'm yeah trying to also like slow things down a bit and not just kind of churn programs out all the time. Um, I think that makes for a better experience for everybody involved. So yeah, I think for me that um, I'm throwing my first ever outdoor live music arts and culture festival in London in September by the name of Overflow and I'm just so excited to do something on that scale post <laughs> post um, post Coco um, <laughs> it'd just be a great way to gather and I feel like uh, in London obviously we have pride and we have black pride but there's nothing that's like of that scale and that includes arts and culture and comes from the kind of holistic space that I'm trying to come at when it comes to festivals and festivaling so yeah I'm really excited to get that like up and running come September please come if you're in London mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, well, I'm excited about the Triennale opening. Um, we, it's not billed, in a sense, as a queer project, but about half the artists in it identify as queer. Um, we're having a seminar on the 1st of October um, from 2 till 6 in Oslo, where the keynote is Jack Halberstam, um, whom I then put in touch with Noura, so he's also coming here, folks. Yes. Uh, the day after, 2nd of October, come back. <laughs> Sorry. I prefer, no, no, good, good, good We're to just fly. so happy about it. <laughs> We're just so excited. I mean, I, I was such a dork at times, just like seeing Jack Halberstam's name in my inbox, in my email, I was like, this is a moment, and sharing it with my, my colleague. Um, and that is sort of, there's moments of excitement, and just like, really, they need to be celebrated, right? Uh, so I think that's going to be super interesting, and, and having him give the keynote and shaping the, the triennial is called The Machine Is Us, which is a quote from Donna Haraway, um, and deals very loosely with the relationship between uh, art and technology. Um, but I think by putting Jack Halberstam at the sort of forefront of the seminar, we're grounding it in a, in a, in a queer and a trans experience and how technology affects, or disproportionately perhaps affects... Um, queer and trans bodies. So I think that's going to be super, super interesting. I'm really excited about it. Um, I mean, I'm such a fan of uh, Jack Halberstam. I might just follow him to Bergen to watch the talk one more time. <laughs> yeah, welcome anytime. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, are there any, any more? Yeah, there's one. Great. Thank you all for your wonderful talk. I'm a little nervous in public. Um, but I, li I lived in the Black Cap, which is a LGBTQ pub in Camden, um, in London, and it, uh, it closed. So I was thinking about the closure of queer spaces and the effects that this has had, particularly in London. Um, Thank you so much. And then I was thinking about residue and that being linked to rave. And then I also thought the fact that a lot of the events that you've organized are in people's memories. So I wondered if you could, like maybe there's a correlation between thinking about the materiality of rave um, and the loss of these spaces um, with memory in the same way that sweat kind of evaporates. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, that text um, that I referenced uh, by Madison Moore, the um, Dark Rooms one, uh, uh, I'll just get the full title for you, Dark Rooms, Sleaze in the Queer Archive. Um, that actually is really relevant to uh, what you were just saying, uh, specifically in terms of uh, sweat and what, what's kind of fugitive and what can't be captured. Um, and I think, but more in terms of the kind of practical uh, conditions of London, I guess that's also very much on my mind and um, 
recently with a few colleagues, we've decided to uh, use the ICA bar like once a month to host late nights, um, which will work, which are more aimed at like finding a more sustainable model for smaller collectives to do parties basically. So it's, it's a very simple model. It's like we just give them a flat fee, they decide how to use it, uh, and then people can come to the space between um, 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. It's not hugely late because our 2 a.m. license is like our only permanent license. Everything else we have to get tens. Sorry, this is a bit like specific logistics, but mm. I think it speaks to like the kind of wider lack of infrastructure in, in London for um, maybe also just like more low key parties mm. because I think everything is really channeled into like, there's a lot of spaces that I go to that I feel like I walk in and then I'm sort of immediately um, uh, sort of guided to the bar. And I, I also don't drink. So like for me, that's not like a particularly pleasant experience or one that I seek. Um, so also thinking about like, I suppose like how to allow for spaces that can be, that can have a more low key register that can sort of evaporate, that they don't need to be, they don't need to have this kind of constant longevity, because I think then that can also slightly um, go into this realm of how clubs are operating now, which is just like, how much are you going to make on the bar? Um, do we want your collective? Does it bring enough people who are going to spend money on the bar? Mm. Like, there's not a lot of other ways that uh, clubs are operating at the moment. Mm. Um, and I, I'm really interested in this idea of like, does something have to last forever? No, can something live on in a memory? Yes, and what, what happens in those moments when something ends? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and really beautiful question, sort of. Uh, balled over by the poetry of it that I wasn't formulating an answer mm. um, but I think uh, not to bring it back to what choked me up earlier but the only one sort of permanent uh, queer place in Oslo is the place that got attacked last night the London pub and it was also when you were talking about intergenerational spaces um, probably one of the few spaces that was truly intergenerational um, as well where you have the entire kind of range of people also because it had a late license so it's where where people would go after other being at other sites mm. um and there was a show i think at uh, the white chapel a couple of years ago mm. oh god knows um yeah. with covid whether it was four years ago or two but that sketched out all of the different kind of queer places in london uh, and it was so, so so sad to see all of these like wonderful, um, really important community spaces that just now were a sort of pr prick on a map um, and some some images perhaps and sometimes not even that. And maybe that goes back to on this, at least when it comes to archiving, um, at least archiving it well so that it has the opportunity to live on uh, mm. in people's memories. All right, any more burning questions? Then I thank you so much you. for being here and for everyone that, that came in this beautiful weather today. And um, yeah, I hope to see you all later um, at, um, at Landmark maybe, or stick around for a chat if you like. But yeah, thank you to all of you.